One of the major highlights of this year's Melbourne Documentary Film Festival is a fascinating documentary called Pushing the Boundaries, the Mavis Bramston Show. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the director of Pushing the Boundaries, Stefan Wellink. Stefan, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thanks very much, Peter. Good to see you. I have such fond memories growing up, which I suppose ages me, uh, with the Mavis Bramston show and, uh, and loving the, uh, the political satire, et cetera. Uh, how did it all come about that you decided to make a documentary about this groundbreaking TV series? I'd always been interested in, in satire and, and comedy and certainly political satire is one of my, my favourite pastimes, really. And uh, I got to know Barry Creighton a little bit and he published a piece in 2014 that said, you know, it's the, the 50th anniversary uh, of the Mavis Bramson show's premiere on Australian TV and no one's celebrating us. Uh, you know, I, I feel we've been forgotten. So I read that and I, and I thought, well, I wonder if anything's ever been made on the Bramson show. And in my searching, no films have been made, no documentaries have been made. There have been one special that it's seven had made on the 30th anniversary. But apart from that, nothing. So I, I, I spoke to Barry and I said, look, I'll see if we can get a documentary going and started doing my research and uh, off we went. Well, I'm so glad that you did because it is such a, a great insight into Australia's first political satire program. And not only that, on commercial television. It, it's quite intriguing the way it was all established in the first place. Yeah, Seven were very brave to do what they did by putting on the Mavis Bramson show. That's the sort of show you would expect even back then to be on the ABC. Although the ABC, like most of Australian society, was very, very conservative. To get a show like that going really, really took someone like Carol Ray, who, who came to Australia uh, from the UK, arrived here in 1964, and she wanted to get back into, into television. She previously to coming to Australia, done a BBC producers course and had been working at the first uh, television station in Kenya, in Nairobi. So she had been cutting her teeth on uh, producing television back then. And when she got here, she met with Sir Charles Moses at the ABC and he said, why don't you try Channel 7? Because she told him she was living at Beecroft, just a stone's throw away from the Seven Studios. So she made an appointment. This couldn't happen today. She made an appointment got in to see Jim Osmond, then the general manager of Channel 7. He liked what she, uh, what she said, he loved her CV. And uh, he said to her, well, what do you want to do? And she said, well, I think I'd like to do something on satire because there's nothing like that. I've been looking around a little bit and, and uh, something like that was the week that was, she said. And he said, well, all right, have a go, see what you can do. So he said, here's 1200 pounds, go and make a pilot. Now, that's unheard of today. Can you imagine today going in to see a general manager of a TV station and them saying, oh, go ahead, you know, no demographics, <laughs> nothing of that nature, gut feel and trust in Carol and, and off she went. And it's amazing that she did. And I must, we must acknowledge that in the Queen's birthday honours list, uh, Carol and Maggie Dents received uh, honours. What a, what a fantastic thing for both of them. Uh, you know, both of them uh, really iconic in their own way. Uh, Maggie was Mavis number two, uh, following Nolene Brown on the Mavis Bramson show. And, and Carol, of course, was the creator. Um, Carol is now 99 years of age, 99 and a half, I think, years of age, living at Kempsey with her, with her family. And, and Maggie lives, I think, at Northbridge in, uh, in, in Sydney. And, and both of them, you know, I think are doing, are doing well. Oh, that's, that's nice to hear. And what a great accolade for them. Now, I, uh, there is so much that you reveal in this documentary. Um, I mean, first of all, people will still ask, um, why Mavis Bramston? Where, what, what was the title from? <laughs> The way that it was uh, related to me was that in, in Australia back then, in the, in the 50s and 60s, we, we used to bring out um, people who were perhaps at the tail end of their career, particularly from the UK, to do various shows, particularly stage shows and, and some television. And we felt that we weren't good enough. You know, we had this cultural cringe issue going on, uh, that we were the, 
the, the little uh, brother or sister of, uh, of, of Great Britain. And in the theatre, particularly in Melbourne, uh, John, Finl John Finlayson said, we call people like that who are a bit over the hill, uh, Mavis Bramson, a bit Mavis Bramson. And, and, that, and that stuck. And when they were thinking about, well, what are we going to call this show? They said, well, why not Mavis Bramson? You know, I think a bit easier to call it Mavis Bramson than what Monty Python went through when they were trying to name the Monty Python show. They had about 20 or 30 titles, but Mavis Bramson seemed to resonate for our, uh, for our people in Sydney. And, and there is uh, how the, the show began and, uh, and the look of the show as well with the... Uh, with the black dress and, and the hat and everything that uh, that goes with that. <laughs> no, that's that's absolutely right, you know. And 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 the, and the part was played to perfection. Firstly, by Nolan Brown, who played the first uh, six episodes, and then uh, she went off to England to pursue her career there. And and then Maggie Maggie Dance, who came in as Mavis Number Two. Yes. Uh, now, we should mention that the show was on air from, I think, around 65 to uh, uh, 69, thereabouts? Uh, it started in 1964. 64. Uh, it, it, it aired in Sydney first. That was the tryout. They did half a dozen episodes. And it was a sensation. And it finished in 1968. 68, right, 64, 68. And now, I would have thought so much of television uh, has disappeared uh, over the years that uh, things were taped over and and so on. But I gather that there are still many surviving episodes of the Mavis Bramson show. Yeah, there's something like 95 or 96 episodes left. Uh, there was a fire in the Channel 7 vaults going back some decades now. And I think the whole of 1967 uh, was, uh, was, was burnt, burnt up and has lost. Uh, the, I think a couple of the earlier episodes in, in 1964 were lost as well. Um, they're now held uh, at the National Film and Sound Archives on behalf of Channel 7. So they're in a safe place now. And as I understand it, there's a process of digitisation going on to try and uh, you know, save uh, what's, on, what's on acetate. And, and apart from the performers we've mentioned, I mean, Gordon Chater, uh, and Barry Creighton, of course, were such mainstays of, of the show. And, and Chater was remarkable. There was nobody like Gordon Chater, I, I think. He, he could, do, could do anything. And like many of the, of the Mavis uh, principals, apart from Carol, uh, he, got his, he got his start at the Phillip Street Theatre, which really was, was the, the place where so many of the wonderful uh, actors and actresses that went on the TV subsequently cut their teeth and made their name. And he could do comedy, he could do serious work, he could do just so many things. And um, Nolene Brown said that, uh, you know, he could do all of those things, but he wasn't, he tried to be sophisticated, but she called him, he was a red-nosed clown, really, at heart. And he loved to do pratfalls and he loved to dress... And, uh, and absolutely brilliant. Yes, you've just, uh, I've just lost you a little bit there, uh, Stefan. Uh, so, still here, Peter. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's just frozen a bit. Okay. And you're talking about Gordon Chater. Yep. Did, did, did you get all of that, Peter, or did, did it drop out? Uh, it dropped out. Can you, yeah, can you just restate what you were saying? Yeah. No, I mean, said that uh, the Chater and he could do and, you know, he loved to do impersonations of women uh, as, as many times as he could uh, portray a woman. Absolutely brilliant. 
uh, and it was hilarious. Yes. Did you lose um, me again? Yeah, it's sort of dipping in and out, unfortunately. Um, ah, yeah, now you're back live. Okay, and uh, uh, yeah, just keep going with your commentary there on Traitor. Yeah, well, Gordon was uh, one of the three people on on, on camera. So it was it was Gordon, yeah. it was uh, Barry Creighton, and and uh, and Carol Ray, and and they used to do the the Oz uh, newsroom at the beginning. And, and yeah. Gordon really uh, was was the star uh, in the early days. He was the he was the big name because Barry hadn't been on television before, and, and Carol was new. But Gordon uh, Gordon would, would would carry a lot of the comedy. Because he was just just so funny. Nolene Brown said, even even though he he, he liked to, to play uh, the uh, he's like the leading man, uh, he wasn't sophisticated. Uh, he was really a red nosed clown, and that was when he was at his best. And uh, he could do it better than anybody else. Uh, and and some of the sketches that you'll see in the film will certainly highlight the brilliance of, of Gordon Chater. Absolutely agree with you. And uh, there is so much to savour in the documentary. Um, obviously, one of the most important things was the writing and of getting the good writers to really hone the political satire, etc. And it's interesting how you um, comment on that or the film, uh, your film very much details the different writers and people involved in uh, Mavis Bramston. Yes, they had they had a writers' room that was uh, that was wonderful. The, really, the 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 core team were David Sale, who uh, Ken Shady, uh, Richard Walsh, uh, really were were the main were the main writers. And uh, Richard Walsh, uh, of course, with his colleagues, uh, started Oz Magazine, and that had already been been out there on the streets, causing controversy uh, in its own way, which led to a court case about obscenity. But they used, uh, they used a lot of uh, Oz to set up each Mavis Bramson program by doing a, a five minute segment at the beginning about news of the day. And it was always, it was always cutting edge. It was always last minute. Uh, you would note that the three principals, uh, Barry, Good and Carol, would be holding clipboards. Mm. And that's because the news was coming out off the newspapers. And the writers would be writing to, you know, two or three minutes before they went on air and everything would be on a clipboard for them. So that's why they held the clipboards. It was really instant news uh, coming to you from Channel 7. And the writers were so important. I mean, as I said, Ken Shady, absolutely a brilliant writer. He, he hadn't trained in writing. He just was a natural. Uh, he went on to write, of course, uh, Crocodile Dundee with Paul Hogan and, and John Cornell. And he also wrote for The Hogan Show and many other programs. Number 96 was another one. Then there was David Sale was a brilliant writer and he used to write a lot of the musical sketches as well, uh, working with Tommy Tico, another genius, who was then the musical director of uh, Channel 7. And, and people like Bill, Bill Harding, you know, who was writing under, under his family name of Bill Salmon back then. He was a 16-year-old schoolboy and he used to submit sketches to the show. And that was another interesting thing about Mavis. They would actually call for sketches from the public or from anywhere. And sometimes they'd have two or 300 sketches a week to go through. Not all of them made it to the air, of course, but some of them were, you know, were, were germs of ideas that were then embellished by the writers on staff. And it was just, just fantastic writing and fantastic playing. And there was a lot of spontaneity in that, uh, in that program. The, the, I think the theatrical training for, for all of them uh, really made it, uh, made them be able to, uh, you know, to really work and be good on their feet. And they were, they were all very good at that. And I must also say that you're moving away from the writing into the other people on, on screen, you know, June Salter was another one who was absolutely brilliant. Uh, so she was really, she became the fourth front person for Mavis when, if Carol was missing for any reason, uh, a June would, would step in and do, and do her role. It was a time like we, 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 we will never see again, I think. Um, you know, the world was a different place in, in, the, in the 1960s, you know. And if I make uh, talk about where Australia had come from, you know, in the, we'd had from 1914 in this country to, to, to 1945, it was either conflict or, or the Great Depression. So there wasn't, 
wasn't a lot of hope going on in Australia in, 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 that, in those decades leading into the 60s. And I think Australians saw Australia as being monochromatic. And it wasn't until the 1960s came uh, with the baby boomers and the Cultural Revolution that Australians started to see the world in Technicolor. And I think that, I think that to me was, uh, uh, was quite impactful. I grew up in that, in that 60s period. And I, I remember the generational changes that went on. You know, people were being better educated. They were asking more questions, therefore. So Australia was right for a satirical program like Mavis Branson. Absolutely, yes. And uh, I mean, we, we see some uh, satire today, uh, both from the US and, uh, and the UK, but here in Australia. But it's not quite the same thing because uh, uh, Mavis Bramson was the groundbreaking um, sort of approach, which uh, made, uh, did so well uh, to, uh, to make Australia grow up, I suppose. <laughs> no, that, that's absolutely right, Peter. And, 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 and really, I, I think in those days, uh, nothing was sacred. You know, you, one could say things like Mavis did. They could take on the politicians, send them up. Um, you know, uh, Sir Robert Menzies was the prime minister at the time, and he used to call for tapes of the show when there was a when there was something that a skit on him, and he used to hold you know, hold a dinner party and show and show the these real to real tapes of uh, of the show, and uh, so. He didn't take himself too seriously by the sound of it, and 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 appreciated good satire. But I think, I think the world is so different now. You know, there there are things one can't say anymore. Uh, you know, there are so many movements going on in the world: the so-called political correctness, the the woke uh, business that goes on. And and I, you know, I don't have any other comment to say other than I think satire has suffered as a, as a consequence, really, uh, because we've just got to be. Everyone's got to be so careful what they say and to whom they say it and how they say it, and that's fine. But comedy, you know, comedy does come from a dark place sometimes, and 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 uh, you know, the best comedy comes from pain. And I don't know how how one can uh, uh, can not offend someone on occasion with comedy uh, if it's to be effective. So um, the, I hope that doesn't affect the viewing of our film because our, our film is very is very upbeat and and shows all the good parts. I think of of how satire can be done in a way that's meaningful and impactful. Absolutely. I fully agree with you. I, I enjoyed watching it so much. I was hoping to see even more. So <laughs> um, I was just wondering, though, in the in the 60s, was there any attempt to stop Channel 7 from screening uh, or airing some of the episodes? I mean, I know there were some censorship issues with uh, the flower arranging sketch, which I thought was hilarious. And, uh, and obviously with some of the political comments, um, were there any legal attempts or other attempts to try and uh, take it off air? Yes, I, the, I think the, the, the writers and the, and, and the, the management of, of Seven had a team of lawyers on, on standby every week, you know, because they were going to offend someone and they did. On occasion, the Catholic Church uh, got very upset with them for a period, and uh, the Ampol uh, was the sponsor of the show, and it was a Bishop Muldoon uh, after a sketch. I think it was Gordon doing a sketch, which offended the Catholic Church, and in fact, I think it, it offended Christian churches in general. But Bishop Muldoon from the Catholic Church said in the newspaper the next day, everyone should sell their shares in Ampol. It's you know it's disgraceful that they're actually supporting this filthy show. And, uh, and of course, uh, the shares in Ampol went up uh, <laughs> almost immediately after he said it. So it was one of the best, one of the best bits of publicity Ampol that you had in the 1960s. But yeah, Gordon Chater got suspended at one point from a couple of episodes. He said the word bum and he was suspended. Um, as I say, it was a very different time, you know, but mm -hmm. they, Pushing the boundaries, I think, is a very apt title for the film because that's what they did. They every week they pushed the boundaries, you know, and 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 they saw things in what was going on in Australia day to day and in other parts of the world on occasion in a very different way to the way people had seen it previously, and have that willingness to to get up and do something about it and say something about it. And it wasn't all satire. There, there, there were some really meaningful social issues addressed as well. 
Um, there was uh, one lovely sketch um, which had a poetry of, of Kath Walker. And, and that really, really resonated. And that was about indigenous people and the way in which uh, they had been treated. Uh, we have to remember too, that Australia uh, was being governed by the white Australia policy back in, in those days. So, so it, was, it was not easy uh, for, for people from um, other countries, uh, particularly if they didn't have the same skin tone uh, as, as, as people who had come from the UK or Europe. So, Mavis were, you know, would do would do shows and, and and sketches that would address those types of issues as well. I mean, they addressed they addressed sexuality, you know, they addressed religion, they addressed women's rights. You know, they're incredibly brave things to do, and 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 I think some of the sketches that one would see if they were played today on on TV are quite mild by in comparison to what we see in some shows on TV today or cable. But, but in, in, in that time, um, they were really, really very, very different and quite out there. Absolutely. Um, so, Stefan, with all the material you had access to with the number of episodes that were uh, still available and with the interviews, et cetera, tell me about your uh, uh, planning of the edit, the final edit of the documentary, because that obviously is uh, a never an easy process at all. In a lot of ways, that's where the film's written. Uh, any film, I think any documentary is written, you, you have to know what you've got. You have an idea of the spine of the film, but then you've got to work out, well, how do we make this narrative flow and make it interesting and entertaining, etc. cetera? We, we wanted to tell not, not just the story of Mavis. We wanted to put Mavis Bramson in context. So we decided to make the film in the context of the time in which it was made and the type of impact that it had and the people that we interviewed and we were very lucky that we had nearly all the principals and, and the major players either writers or on-screen talent uh, available to us uh, those that could be available to us to to interview so uh, apart from Gordon Chater and June Solder who had passed away we we interviewed you know Barry, Craden, Carol Ray, uh, Maggie Dance, Nolene Brown you know, all the writers, we, we interviewed them. And, and, and we also wanted to look at some of the unknown uh, bits of what Mavis Bramson was. It wasn't what you see on screen is certainly important. That's the finished product. But it was a lot of what was happening behind the scenes as well. So that's why we decided to include something about the writers. And we did that. Something about the music, uh, Tommy Tico's brilliant music, uh, that he would write virtually on the spot, you know, uh, so we wanted to show the dynamic nature of the show and how every week uh, it was a rush, you know, starting with a, a, a clean sheet or a clean whiteboard in the office, uh, then having to write from Monday to Wednesday a whole new show <laughs> to air on Thursday. We wanted to show the, 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 the rush that they, they were getting, the adrenaline flow that they had and, and what they had to, had to combat. So we wanted to do all that and we wanted to put all that then in context with Australia in that period. What was Australia like, uh, you know, and, and, and show that they did things without fear or favour. And I think importantly, the other aspect for me was that how Carol Ray, uh, who immigrated to Australia in 1964, uh, became the first senior executive on television in Australia. You know, the, fir the first woman to be senior executive in Australia, Australian TV. That is significant for us. You know, she, she didn't just go, you know, hit the glass ceiling. She went right through it. Unfortunately, it took a long time for others to follow her. But it, it just shows me the, the bravery of her, Carol, and the bravery of Channel 7 to say, we will back you. I must also pay a, a bit of homage too to a fellow called Michael Plant, who uh, Carol was uh, producer for the first six episodes. But she was finding it tough going to do everything that she was doing, plus appear on screen as well. So Michael Plant, a very young Australian, only in his late 30s, who had done a lot of work in the theatre in Australia. He was a child prodigy in that sense, as a writer and producer. He'd gone to the US and he'd written for the Barbara Stanwyck show and various other shows on American TV. He came back to Australia and he came in then as, as a producer, and that was 1965. He died uh, during that 
that season during the 1965 run. And, and the show, I think, lost its way for a while in 65 because he really was, from a producing point of view, a driving force for the, for the program. And he, he's someone who I think deserves a lot of accolade for what he did in, uh, in allowing, uh, with the executives at Seven, allowing Mavis to do what it did. He didn't take a step backwards, Michael Plant. Apparently, he's quite an extraordinary man. And we cover his uh, his involvement in the in the show. So we, I mean, the the whole thing really for me, uh, if it had just been a cradle to grave, Mavis started in '64. It was about satire, and it ended in '68. Well, that's interesting in one level, but there's always so much more to these stories. It's really what what happened, what led to that, what drove them to do what they did, what what obstacles did they face, how did they overcome those obstacles. How did they overcome the politics, you know, the church, you know, the RSL, they, they, those, those bastions for conservatism, you know, they, they were able to take them on and, uh, you know, and, and put out quality product for, for, for four years, which uh, was, was quite spectacular. And the other thing was they had to take on Graham Kennedy. Mm. Graham Kennedy was on Channel 9 and he was the, he was the big name. And I think, I think Channel 7 decided that they needed something to take on the Graham Kennedy show, and, and Mavis uh, was out raiding him in, in 64 and 65, for sure. So they, uh, they really succeeded uh, for Channel 7 in a, in a big way. Certainly did. Well, Stefan, the film is screening as part of the uh, Melbourne Documentary Film Festival, which is fantastic. Uh, is it also going to get uh, other opportunities for screening? At this stage, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, well, certainly during uh, during the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival, which we're delighted about being part of, it's it's, it's only screening online from uh, July first for, for that month. That's available to be watched for that whole month of July. We didn't get a Guernsey in theatre, but we're looking at the moment at some theatrical special screenings uh, on the east coast of Australia. We don't have anyone yet who um, has uh, shown interest from a sales point of view, but we haven't gone to anyone either. So the strategy has been to get it into a festival or two, get some reaction uh, and, uh, and, and go from there and see if we can get some interest to, uh, to go more broadly. Well, hopefully you do, because the film deserves um, a lot of interest and, and uh, more opportunities for screening it. Uh, um, I mean, I, I, I suppose it could end up uh, on streaming services or Foxtel or one of those uh, um, channels, I suppose. Well, I think that would be, would be an ideal home. Uh, either of those options would be an ideal home for the type of film that this is. Um, yes. Yes. No, 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 I, th I thank you for your interest, Peter. It's, it's really, really nice. Thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. I loved it. No, such fond memories of the uh, of the show. So, Stefan, tell me, you've made a number of documentaries and films, etc. How do you decide what you're going to make? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. I mean, I've, I've got an extensive library uh, here and a, a lot of it is, is film. And, and what, I, what I tend to do, I, I might read something or hear something or watch something and I'll think, I wonder if anything's ever been done on that person or that period of time. And quite often I'll go to my own library uh, or I'll go to the library or I'll look online to see what's been done. If nothing's been done and, it's, and I think it might be of interest, I'll, I'll start researching and, and select it that way. In the case of the films I've made so far, apart from the, the Rod Taylor one, which is my first film that I produced, that really went back to my childhood, and and it was uh, you know something that my father and I used to love. We used to love Rod Taylor and, and his films, and that was really an homage to my dad uh, that got that going. But again, nothing had been done on Rod Taylor, and nothing has been done on him since that film, which came out in 2016. So, so the other films, I if if I find if I tend to like something, I think I'm a fairly average sort of movie goer or or, or film lover then my assumption is that other people are likely to enjoy it as well. So that's often in my mind. I don't worry about demographics or <laughs> I don't make film uh, in accordance with the way a lot of people might do it nowadays. That might be blasphemy for some, but I think uh, for me, it's from the heart. I, I think if, it, if it's resonating in my heart and my mind says it's a good idea, 
I'll, I'll have a look and take it further. Excellent news. Uh, and uh, I don't suppose you're working on something at the moment? Yeah, we, uh, we, we're well into production on Tommy Tico, film on the great maestro Tommy Tico. Uh, we're calling it The Maestro. And again, another extraordinary story about an immigrant uh, from Hungary who, uh, who made Australia his home and, and succeeded against all odds. You know, he, uh, he had, he had, his is quite a story, you know, again, a child prodigy, um, learned under some of the greats uh, in, in Budapest, uh, like, like Kodai, uh, the, great, uh, the great musician Kodai, and, and, and uh, you know, came here with a classical training. He could do any genre. Uh, you could cross any genre, and some of the names, the people that we're that we're interviewing for that film, and will be in the film, are some of the biggest names in Australian entertainment uh, over the past fifty years, actually. So uh, that's quite exciting. And of course, Mavis gets a Guernsey in that film because that's uh, that, that's how Tommy got his exposure on TV, really, through that show. Great. I am really looking forward to that. Uh, you make some fascinating films, Stefan, and uh, we've been speaking to uh, Stefan Wellink, who is the director of Pushing the Boundaries, the Mavis Bramston Show, um, a uh, documentary feature not to be missed as part of the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival. Stefan, thank you so much for talking with me. It's been a great pleasure, Peter, and I hope to catch up with you again soon. All the best. Thanks again. You too. Thank you, Peter. Bye. Bye-bye.